got just about seven o'clock here, uh, February 1st already. Um, it's currently it's in internet degrees here in uh, downtown Baltimore. Um, so welcome to round two. Of uh, 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 <clears throat> our presentation for 2023. Um, tonight, uh, Paul, Sam, right, Paul, uh, is going to do a presentation. I forget what year this came out, but Paul did a presentation on it uh, last year at the Babe Ruth Museum. Um, we can see by his hat his uh, Yankees loyalty. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that by any means. And a um, couple quick. Um, with regards to Saber Day, obviously, it for those of you who are coming on February 20th, that it's going to be in person only. We're not going to have a Zoom component. Uh, hopefully, we will record more of the, the segment uh, for each of you. And, um, but, uh, yeah, hopefully, for those who, of you who live around here and have the day off, uh, we'd, we'd love to see you there. We have a pretty good lineup with Ryan Ripkin and um, another Oriole, uh, George Lad, you know, it's, it, you've done pretty good for a, a, not having any for the past three years. Um, I had a kitty cat in my, my life. Sits up and puts her ears in. Here we can. Now we can. <laughs> um, I've been talking this whole time and nobody heard a damn thing. Uh, uh, you, you've been in and out. I, I've only heard. Just switched to a different network, so hopefully this is a little bit better. Um, yeah, it looks like. Yeah. yeah. Um, the problem with the, you know, some days are better than others. Um, well, Paul, let, you can get started. Yeah, Mark is also, Mark Drucker is also, um, there you go. That's better, Mark. Thanks. You look like yeah, you're a psychedelic. Um, yeah, yeah. I have no idea. So, Paul, why don't you take it? And uh, we'll, I'll make you a co-host if you have anything to share. And uh, take it away, and I'll talk to everybody at the end. All right, so wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Your recording just stopped. It just started again. All right, good. So uh, I had a good chance to meet you last summer. I, would, I did my presentation on The Least Among Them at the uh, Babe Ruth Museum, which was obviously an honor for a big Yankees fan like me to have the opportunity to go to uh, Baltimore and to have a chance to present at that museum. We didn't get to a ball game. My wife and I just made it a, a quick overnighter, but... Um, my favorite stadium, and, and it's probably wrong for me to say this out loud, and it might drop to second place, but because, um, but I'll get to that in a minute. But my favorite stadium right now of any stadium is Camden Yards. I, I think it's phenomenal. Uh, I'm a retired uh, uh, school principal. And when I was a middle school principal, we would take, uh, I live in New Jersey, Northern Jersey. We would take our kids on a three-day trip to Washington, D.C., as so many schools do. And on the way home, we would always stop in Baltimore and take a tour of Camden Yards. It was, it was, and it is that impressive. So that was always a highlight for a lot of the kids. It was always a highlight of the trip for me. Broke up the ride home in one hand, but better than that, it was just fun to have a chance to walk through Camden Yards and, and be part of that whole experience. Now, in May, I'm going to a ball game in Pittsburgh. I haven't been to PNC Park and I hear it's phenomenal. So Maybe Camden Yards drops to number two, but 
Um, it'll probably, if nothing else, just be one, one and one A, but I, I haven't been to Pittsburgh yet and seen that stadium. And like I say, everybody says it's great. The other thing that really uh, caught my eye when we were down there in Baltimore uh, last summer was I absolutely loved the statue of Brooks Robinson that's outside of Camden Yards because his glove was made out of gold. I just thought that was an absolute phenomenal design idea. Now, as a Yankee fan, and if you see him right back here over my uh, shoulder, my favorite player growing up was Greg Nettles. I, I am a little mad. Now, this I shouldn't say out loud with a Baltimore group, but I'm a little mad that Brooks got all those gold gloves because I, I wish Greg had gotten a few of them and it might help his Hall of Fame chances uh, someday. So anyway, uh, I did love the fact that they put the gold gloves on, on Brooks Robinson. So I thought that was really one of the cooler things I've ever seen on a statue. So I'm I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, I can talk about my book, The Least Among Them. And I could also talk about the book that I have coming out in April, um, which is the autobiography of Roy White, the former Yankee great. And probably, believe it or not, the, if you break it by position only, the greatest left fielder in the history of, of the New York Yankees. And that's my first collaboration with any Major League Baseball player um, on, a, on a book project. And um, I met Roy White last year. Um, I'd reached out to him through a friend who had his contact, who said to him on my wishes, like, if you want to write your autobiography, I know a guy who will do it with you. And one thing led to the next. And Roy White actually, without ever meeting me, said, yeah, I think I'll do it. And we spent a year writing his book. It comes out in, in April. And it should be, I think. But of course, I have to think that way because I'm the author, but I think it's phenomenal. It's a great story about Roy White and the Yankees from 1965 through the rest of his career through 79. Of course, another good year for the Orioles. They beat the Yankees out in 79 and went to the World Series. Um, and then, you know, the, what is what happens in his career afterwards? He goes to Japan, becomes a Yankees coach and and the life of a, of a true great lifelong baseball player. But for this book, the least among them, and just just so you know, let me let me just take one more step backwards, so that we're all on the same page. Uh, for 32 years, I was a, a public school educator. I'm still a college professor as an adjunct up at Ramapo College in Mawa, New Jersey. But my full time career as an educator ended after last summer. My first day of retirement was September 1st. So as a lifelong educator, I can talk. Uh, you know till three o'clock in the morning before I take a breath. So I'll talk, but if anybody wants to interrupt me, I, I do not like, I'm not one of these people that says you can't talk until the end, save all your questions, jump right in, ask me a question, challenge me. If I make a point like Greg Nettles deserves some Brooks Robinson's gold gloves, you could say you're out of your mind, go home. And, and that could lead to some fun discussions. Um, I'm not your typical Yankee fan. I, I want the Yankees to win every game and, and I wish they would win every World Series. But, you know, I'm, I, I do love the other teams and I have respect for the other teams. And as I said at the start, I love Camden Yards. I think it blows away Yankee Stadium uh, as, as far as the stadium goes. So I'm um, just um, co-host. So if people want it to be admitted. I just admitted somebody. So let me tell you a little, little about this book. Uh, it's called The Least Among Them. And basically, it's the story of the 29 Yankees whose entire career was like Moonlight Graham in the movie Field of Dreams. The Yankees have a great history. You can't tell the story of baseball without telling the history of the Yankees, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle. We all know the names and we all know all the World Series and all the great Yankee moments, good and bad, like when Jackie Robinson stole home. And I used to say he was out, but I saw a couple of months ago a different camera angle and he was safe. Or Bill Mazarowski beating the Yankees in the 1960 World Series. <laughs> and uh, so good or bad, you know, but the Yankees are baseball in, in so many ways. The biggest names, the greatest names, and, and even the Yankees being referenced in movies like Pride of the Yankees in 61 and in songs like Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, mentioning Joe DiMaggio and Mrs. Robinson and things like that. So you can't tell the story of the Yankees without talking about those famous players, but there were other guys and there's hosts of them, but 
there are other guys, 29 players that I identified who were Yankees for just a day. And I felt that their stories also needed to be told. And so I wrote the book about those 29 guys and their careers. Now, each of them, their entire major league career was just one game. And that was it. So um, they never played for another team. They never had another opportunity to play major league baseball. They were just like Moonlight Graham, one game. That was it. And each of their stories, I feel, is interesting and fun. And, and I think it just tells the history of the Yankees in a different way. We focus again on the big famous guys and we sort of ignore most people. Uh, these guys, especially since they only played in one game, most of them have been lost to history. Most of them, um, nobody even knows their names. So I thought it'd be fun to write a story about them. But in the book, I don't just tell the story of the player because that could get tedious, I felt. Here's a guy, he made it to the major leagues and he played one game. Most of them really didn't do that well. That's one reason why they only played one game. And then he never made it back to the major leagues. Next chapter, same thing, right? So what I tried to do and what I did, I guess, I tried to do successfully. The If you read the book or if you read the book, you can tell me if I did a good job or not. But I took an event or a player or something that happened in that game that that player played in. And then I extrapolated a bigger story about the Yankees mostly or baseball in general that had a result of something about that player or the game he played in. Um, one guy played against the Detroit Tigers. And, you know, when he played, he played against uh, Lou Whitaker and Alan Trammell who are the longest uh, consecutive playing se second base and shortstop combination. So in the ancillary chapter, which I call extra innings, in that chapter, I talk about the Yankees who have been teammates the longest over, over the history. Um, in some of the other chapters, I talk about the Yankees who came from Japan. Uh, I talk about the Yankees who were two sport athletes who played professional sports in more than just baseball. Um, I talk about the origins of the seventh inning stretch because one of the players went to Manhattan College. Um, one of the players changed his name, as a lot of people did in the early 20th century, to make it sound more Americanized, if you will. And so I talk about Yankees who changed their names, uh, Yankees who served in World War II, um, and things like that. So I believe it's a, an interesting book. I, I think it was uh, it's fun to read, and I enjoyed talking about it. And um, again, I'd love to tell you some stories about some of the guys, or I'd love to answer your questions. So before I continue talking, why don't I just open up the floor and we'll see how that leads to any more or different discussions. And, and then I could continue if you, if you want. Let's be all free to unmute and ask. Uh, Roy, Roy White also wasn't he also the hitting coach for the Oakland Athletics, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Roy White was a hitting coach, a minor league baseball coach with okay. the with the uh, Oakland A's, um, and he did that like in the late two uh, 1999, 98, 99, 2000 era. Uh, one of the stories he tells in the book is. One player he taught how to hit better was Mark Bellhorn. Okay. And Bellhorn, of course, it's a big home run against the Yankees when he's playing for the Red Sox in 2004. So he had been his coach and he sort of put his head down and wanted to keep quiet about that as, as the Red Sox were beating up on the Yankees and changing history that year when they finally reversed the curse. But yes. And one more comment. I think Greg Nettles, if I'm not mistaken, if memory serves me correct, did win two gold gloves. Yes, uh, he, he won two in 77 yeah. and 78. Um, the guy who broke Brooks's streak, I think, was Aurelio Rodriguez. Yes. Who won yes. it in 76. And Brooks had won every one up until 1975. Yes. So Nettles is like 14 gold gloves behind the great Brooks Robinson. That is correct. And so <laughs> I, I would argue 
And maybe it's good that we're not in person down together because maybe it all just uh, you know, start throwing things at me if we were in a restaurant, Darn. French fries. And, How dare you? Um, by the way, Brooks Robinson, when I was a kid, yeah. um, there used to be a book. I don't know if any of you remember it called the baseball address book. They used yes. to advertise it all the time yeah. and all the yeah. various publications. So I bought that. And, you know, this was in the very early days of collecting and people really becoming hoarders and things like that. Um, the only big time collector was Barry Halper. If you remember his name, they used to always put him in those books and he had this great collection of uniforms and trinkets and bats and stuff. Um, but we would look at their names and we would write them letters. Oh, really? And Brooks Robinson, well, you know, put a couple of baseball cards in a self-addressed stamped envelope. Um, he would always send them back signed. So, I mean, like that became a cool thing. Like Brooks Robinson will sign our cards and send them back. So he got a letter and then he'd get another letter from a different friend of mine. And then we'd send another letter. So I, I probably have like four or five Brooks Robinson autographs on little baseball cards uh, upstairs because he was always so nice about it. And that's what everybody always says is, is he was, is he was a classy, classy guy. Um, yes. What I would say is my argument is Greg Nettles is a borderline Hall of Famer, never really has gotten a lot of love uh, for the <laughs> Hall of Fame. If you look at his lifetime war, it's 68. And if people like Jay Jaffe was just on the baseball network last week during the uh, Hall of Fame announcement, he says if you're 60 or above, you're pretty much a Hall of Famer. So Nettles has a number of points above that. I think he was unappreciated in his time. And so my only argument is – Maybe if he didn't have two gold gloves and he had five or four, maybe if a couple of those gold gloves went his way, people would say, oh, he's got more. Two just doesn't sound impressive. So I, that, yeah. that's my argument. Yeah, his uh, big thing was he played in the American League at around the same time Brooks was playing. And that was the problem. Yes. I have I've, that book. <laughs> which book? It's called the Baseball Autograph Collector's Book. Oh, Is that the nice. One? 81. <laughs> That's awesome. Is that the one you had? <laughs> Mine was called the Baseball Address Book. Oh, well, this has all their addresses. Oh, my God. Wait, is it yeah. new? 81. It, Baseball from America. From, from 1981. Yeah. Wow. Well, I don't know if it's 81. No, 2001. So oh, they 2000, still right. were doing so, it. They were still doing yeah, it by then. Yeah, That's cool. Easy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess when I'm, I'm talking about like probably 1983, 1982, it was called the baseball address book. I think hmm. it was called. Yeah. Hi, Pete. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm fine. There's a, there's all kinds of places online now. Uh, one place is called uh, through the mail TTM and it's a whole um, website thing uh, that you don't, have to uh, sign up for you don't have to pay any money uh and um it lists addresses addresses of a lot of different people not only baseball there's a uh, football hockey basketball uh and some um star stars uh you know movie stars and stuff of that nature and it's called through the mail if you're crazy about it uh but you got to be careful because uh not all the addresses might be correct. And um, it's it's a big chat room and a lot of people who do do a lot of through the mail um, stuff will tell you, hey, that's a that's a wrong address. He's actually here. So if you're crazy, you know, about getting autographs through the mail, you can try and do that. Um, but but the, the the players now have caught on and, you know, they're asking for money. So uh, uh, who in particular, um, Braves, uh, the big hitter for the Braves won't sign without money. Um, uh, he's shipper. No, uh, the not Murphy, uh, Mark, um, <clears throat> try not to get old everyone. Cause that's what happens. <laughs> you forget everything, including your name. Um, I'll thank you his name and, and, and get back to you. But, uh, He's he'll they'll send things if you send them a self addressed animal, they'll just send you your cards back with nothing on it. So interesting. But some of them you're saying do do still sign. Some of the, you know, a lot of them will sign, you know, through the mail. I used to do a lot of old Washington Senators players and they're just happy to be remembered. You know, I mean who remembers Bud Ziffel? 
<laughs> That's another, great. Another one year wonder for those senators and stuff like that. Uh, can I ask who published your book? Okay, so the, the publisher is called Artemisia Publishing. I'll pull it up here in the corner. They're a small um, independent publisher, but it's it's not a self-published. It's it, they're they're legitimate. It's traditional publishing. Um, they're located in New Mexico, and I have to be honest, like they're phenomenal. Um, I have a. I'm not trying to sell anything, but I have an. Uh, this is my novel, with a lot of baseball themes in it. And listen, anybody who's ever tried to get published, or um, at least in my experience, I sent my novel to independent publishers, big publishers, little publishers, you name it, and all that kind of stuff, and you know, got rejected a million and a half times. That's sort of the story. Yeah. Um, they liked it. They said, "We we like this. We'll publish it." And the customer service I got, um, the marketing that they did on my behalf and everything like that, I was just so impressed. And um, I've talked to other people who've been published by big publishing houses and who haven't done the same kind of work that, that Artemisia has done as a small publishing house. For example, if you get, um, I don't know if it's the latest, but the two previous issues of Baseball Digest, there's a full page ad for uh, for this book. And the publisher did that. Um, a lot of times uh, publishers don't, don't necessarily do big time stuff like that. So I've been very pleased with them and they're also the, they're also the people who are publishing, um, the Roy White book, which is coming out in April. I'll tell you a funny story. This is Roy White's rookie card with a guy named, uh, Rich Beck on it. And Roy White, uh, one of the things I wanted to do for the book was ask him, which are his favorite baseball cards. So when we got together one day, I brought all my Roy White baseball cards and just said, like, which are your favorites? So I have it in the in, in the uh, appendix of the book in the back. These are Roy White's favorite baseball cards. And he laughed when he got this one. He says, oh, I see this one all the time. So what happens is people, if they get Rich Beck's autograph, he signs his half. And then when he sends it back, he says, if you want to get Roy White's Here's his address. <laughs> <laughs> really? yeah, so, so Rich Beck said he gets Roy White's address and Roy White gets his the other card. And he's like, oh, I guess I have to sign it. Um, so that's kind of funny. That, the stories like that. I'll tell one other funny uh, story like that about Roy White again is, listen, I'm a nobody. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a retired now, but I was an elementary school principal and a middle school principal and a lifelong educator. So I was surprised that Roy White even called me back when, when I suggested that I write his book. The thing I said to Roy White, which made me different than I think everybody else who had approached him was I said, I will write your book your way. It will be your story. It won't be my story. I'm not going to do any editorial privilege or writer privilege. You will have the final say over every word in the book. Um, you could even have the final say over every common period and anything else, but he didn't necessarily care about that. But, you know, when he was a Yankee, he played with Mickey Mantle at the tail end of Mantle's career. And then he played with the Yankees through the 70s, through the wild and crazy Bronx Zoo years with you know Reggie and Munson and Sparky Lyle and Billy Martin and George Steinbrenner when the Yankees were on the back pages of all the New York newspapers creating chaos. And my sense is, though he never said this specifically, but it's basically the, the general sense is most of the big time writers said to him, um, yeah, we'll write your book. Let's write your book. But tell us all the dirt. Like, oh. you know, and, and he doesn't want to do that. He is genuinely a wonderful human being. Like when you meet your idols, right? And I grew up as a Yankee fan in the late 70s. So Roy White was the left fielder. I mean, he was a god. Usually they have clay feet oftentimes. And he's he's just the nicest person in the world. But when we were just starting to our work, there were a couple times when he had to cancel our meetings. And, you know, I always believed him because I believe you can tell sincerity in a person. And I always sensed he was being honest and truthful. But if, so, if someone wanted to be cynical, they could have said like, huh. That's interesting. He keeps canceling. But every time he canceled, he had a good excuse. The first time was he had to stay home because an appliance was being delivered and it was late, which cracked me up because 
he's a major league baseball player. He should have been the first one on the list. You mean major league baseball players have appliances delivered and they don't come on time. That can't possibly be. Um, so that cracked me up. And then a, about two times later, we were going to meet and he called me and he said, I can't meet with you. Um, I have to go to Connecticut. I have to go to a baseball card show because Joe Pepitone just called out sick and Joe called me and he needs me to ride up there and pinch hit for him literally. So I, I just thought that was great. Like it, there's this different world that you guess you never see. Right. So I believed him and he was telling the truth, of course, but that was kind of fun that Roy White couldn't meet with me because he had to drive up to Connecticut to, to sign autographs because Joe Pepitone uh, I, couldn't. I had a similar problem with uh, Frank Howard. I, uh, I, I spoke with him and I asked to, write his biography. I've done two biographies already, and I wanted to try and, and get him on record. There is a biography of uh, Frank Howard that was written a long time ago, uh, I, right after he finished his career. And it's, and it's, and I hate to be overly critical, but it's, it's lame. It's just, it's not, it's not very good. And it's not who he is. And I couldn't even get to that. I was going to try and make your point of saying that he'd have full control over it. But he just absolutely said, no, I'm not writing any kind of biography. And he's he he doesn't want to say a bad word about anybody. And he's afraid that some story that he tells is going to make somebody's granddaughter unhappy. And so he 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 refuses to do anything that's that w will do anything. And he just said no. And and you got to know Frank Howard. He's this is just the way that he is when he, he doesn't say goodbye. He just hangs up the phone. He just he he doesn't no he doesn't no he doesn't say goodbye. He just says you know uh, uh, oh yeah I just can't do it. Appreciate it. Click. And wow. That's it. And but 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 no it's it, he's I've been to other places where he's done interviews and stuff like that. It's just when he's finished talking he just hangs up the phone. He just he doesn't say goodbye, see you later, or anything like that. But anyway, but yeah uh, the the people can be. Um, you know, uh, hinky that way. They don't want. They don't want to dish the dirt, like you said. The 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 the, the, uh, the publishing companies want to see scandalous kind of stuff to sell books and things of that nature. And <clears throat> we've already we've already got ball four. We don't need anything else, you know. And I love ball four. That was like one of the first baseball books I ever read. Again, I was like thirteen years old. I probably was too young to read it. I didn't know that you could put certain words together in any order. Um, uh, and, and Joe Schultz and uh, taught me a lot of things, right? And, and, and uh, Jim Bouton taught me a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, great book. I laugh still and when I read it, but I agree with you. We, we, Roy White's book didn't need to be ball four. It needed to be Roy White's book. Yeah. In the process of writing this, now this I haven't... Um, solidified but i did talk to a teammate of his and i'll just keep it very general like that and that teammate did not feel like you said with frank howard that the book that the teammate had published um really represented the way that teammate wanted the story told so i reached out to that teammate and said as we were talking i said well this is what i'm doing with roy white i'll do it with you um when i'm done and that teammate said yeah that'd be great so I reached back out, I guess, two weeks ago and said, hey, remember me, blah, blah, blah. And he said, yes, we'll be in touch soon. So <laughs> that's one of those things where you're just crossing your fingers and you hope we'll be in touch soon. And it's not just like, stop bothering me. Yeah. So, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that's my, my, next, uh, my next project. Good luck. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not the type of writer who writes scandalous stuff, again, with my novel. My novels, uh, and I don't, I'm not going to spend four hours on this, but my novel is a story of a, of a young man whose father dies. And before he can get his inheritance, his father leaves these letters with the uh, attorney that says, before you can get your inheritance, you need to scatter my ashes. That's the title of the book in various spots that had been meaningful in their lives and things like that. It's a, yeah, it's a heartwarming story, yada, yada, yada. But it's written nicely. So one of the funny things was when I'd get rejected by a lot of different publishers, they'd say, it's just too nice. It's, it's, there's not enough bad stuff in that. And there is a very strong uh, 
religious element. It's about death and, and he's father, he lost his father. And so there's, there's scenes where he's praying and things like that. So I said, oh, I'll take it to a Christian publisher. And so I took it to a couple of Christian publishers and there was one uh, literary agent who represented Christian fiction who read it and loved it. He said, it's great. I'm like, yes, finally, my big chance. And he goes, but there's a scene, nothing happens. It's not graphic at all, where a man sleeps over the house of a woman. Um, and there is a scene, I think there might be the S word. I don't know if it's, uh, if I actually took it out in the final edition, but there was a scene in the draft at the time with an S word. That's like the worst word in the whole book, just once. And he goes, well, you have too much profanity. And there's a scene where a man's in a woman's apartment. So it's too dirty for Christian fiction. <laughs> so it's, it was too dirty for, for that, but it was too clean for everybody else until I found Artemisia. They, they, they published it. So um it, it is interesting how the the world is in as in regard to what they're looking for in in published works and and the hurdles you go through in order to get there but you know like anything else it's about perseverance and grit and keep trying and, and moving forward and, and working hard at it uh, paul i i had a, a comment and question for you um i uh i was very lucky uh i uh met someone who if he had continued with his uh, professional baseball career, might have made himself eligible to be included and in, in the least among them. Uh, his name was James Conlon. Um, he uh, was college educated, uh, which you know was relatively rare back in the um, uh, in the 30s, and he managed to survive World War II. Um, and his parents were really upset that you know even after a college education, even after surviving the war, he wanted to keep, you know, playing ball. Um, and so he made a, he had to make a deal with his parents. If I can't earn uh, a starting big league job uh, in five years, I'll quit and I'll, you know, put my degree to work and, and go into business. And the mistake he made was saying starting job. Um, so at the at the tail end of uh, the 41 season, um, he got called, he was he was in the Tigers system and he was from Michigan. Um, so he's you know very happy about that. And um, he gets called up at the end of the season, but never gets in a game. Um, but like just even sitting on the bench in Tiger Stadium where, you know, he had sat in the stands as a as a as a kid. Um, he said it was just the, the thrill of a lifetime. Uh, and that was the end in 41. That was the end of season four. And um, over the course of that offseason, someone from the Yankees organization was like, you know, please stick around because like, you know, you would be an ideal fourth outfielder uh, for us going into 42. And he said, yeah, the problem is I play center and you have DiMaggio. Um, and so I, I promised my parents a starting job. And so like being a fourth outfielder, that ain't going to cut it for me. Um, so he he hung it up, went to work at General Motors um, and had a very long and successful career there and ended up in the, the same retirement community as, as my grandfather. Uh, and I got to got to talk baseball with him. So, but who knows, like, you know, if he hadn't told his parents starting job, maybe he sticks with the Yankees, maybe he only gets in one game and, you know, he would have had to write a few more pages. Yeah, and that would have been great. That would have been yeah. great. Um your, your story reminds me of a guy named Hal Stowe, who pitched for the Yankees one game in 1960. He's in the book. And you talk about fate and, and how things happen. Hal Stowe was a pretty good pitcher. And Casey Stengel was really high on him. And Casey Stengel was like, you know, next year, you're on the team, man. You're, you're going to be a big part of the 61 Yankees. Well, we all know what happens. I think Tom was is happy about this. I, I think he was cheering before. Bill Mazarowski hits the home run and the Pirates win the World Series and Casey Stengel's not invited back for the 61 season. And for whatever reason, the new Yankee manager, Ralph Houck, doesn't really think highly of Hal Stowe. So Hal Stowe never makes the team out of uh, spring training and never gets into, I think he might have even made the team, but he never gets into a game in 61. And goes back to the minor leagues and he never makes it back again. So, mm. you know, Bill, Bill Mazeroski's Homer indirectly <laughs> leads, leads to Hal Stowe's major league baseball career being ended because of, of, of a fluke. Uh, so it, it's, it's just interesting how these things all tie together like that. Well, and I wanted to ask you um, a little bit about the um, autobiography. Um, so um, 
I think my favorite, I, I did a lot of uh, umpiring um, growing up, you know, little league stuff. Um, and so like uh, the men in blue um, was just a fabulous book. And I got to meet Larry Gerlach um, and, and tell him how much I admired it. Uh, but you know, that book's almost 30 years old now. And I would, I would love at some point to do, you know, the, the same kind of format with just more recent um, umpires, but you know, I, I don't really know sort of, you know, how to get, a get the ball rolling, but even, you know, if I could get an a, initial bit of like interest, like any, any advice on sort of how to, to, you know, to build that trust, how to structure the conversations to, to, you know, um, get them rolling and, and get them uh, not necessarily giving you juicy stuff, but you know, the, the stuff that they're most uh, passionate about, how, you know, how do you, um, uh, how did you go about doing all of that? All right. So I don't necessarily have advice on how you reach those people. Um, but I do believe that if you could reach an umpire and have a conversation, um, you don't know where, where that can lead. And if you can then make that connection with that person. And, and I, think, I think what it comes down to is th there's an old Japanese saying, um, and I, I'm not going to do it justice, but basically it's we live our lifetime building a reputation and we can destroy it in a matter of moments, right? Like, so in order to build trust, you have to be trustworthy. And then the entire time, you have to demonstrate that you still will be trustworthy. So all I can tell you is that every time I met with Roy White, when we were done, I took what we had talked about. I made it into a writ the written word. Um, the beginning, I was doing it. Um, it was last January. So this was still sort of a lot of COVID stuff. And we tried to do it over Google Meet and things like that. And I was just writing answers into a notebook and then I type it all up. Uh, then we started meeting in person. But but every time I would then finish up what we talked about um, by writing it and then emailing it to him. Um, sometimes I put it as an attachment that didn't always work. So a couple of times I then printed it out and mailed it to him. Sometimes I put it in the text of an email, but when we would meet the next time, and I'm, I'm very proud of this fact, as I'd say, like, is, is there anything in there that you don't want in there? And he was like, no, because everything that was in there was basically what he had talked about. And, and I didn't do any editorializing or any, any of my own things. And, and if I were to do that, I, was, I would call him and I'd say, hey, you know what? I think I need to mention X, Y, or Z. Are you okay with that? Like, for example... That game in 1977 in Boston, when Reggie supposedly loafs after a fly ball, it drops in front, and Billy Martin, who didn't get along with Reggie, marches out and he takes you know uh, Reggie out of the game, and he sends Paul Blair out there to right field to take over for Reggie, and Reggie's like, "What?" and he goes into the dugout on national TV, and the two almost come to fisticuffs and and all that kind of stuff. So I said, I think we probably have to mention that. Uh, so tell me about it. And he was only too happy to talk about that. And he really felt he was in left field at the time that Reggie wasn't dogging it. He said, by that point in his career, Reggie wasn't a great outfielder. He wasn't loafing. He just didn't get it. And Billy Martin was looking for a chance to, to up, uh, to, to show him up. So, um, I also didn't press him for more information. Like I didn't say, Ooh, tell me more. He was on the Yankees in the early 70s when Mike Kekich and Fritz Peterson traded wives and families and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, um, one of the people who I had read the manuscript ahead of time as I was writing it um, said, you need to talk about the Keith Kekich and Peterson wife swap, family swap thing. And so I said, do you mind talking about it? And he said, yeah, I'll talk about it in a general sense. We, nobody saw it coming. We, we knew that they were friends and we'd just been at their house up in Oakland, New Jersey at a party not too long before that. And we were all shocked as they were. But I didn't say like, ooh, so like, what did they say? And, and I, I never, ever pushed that limit with him. I let him tell the story. Sometimes I'd follow up a little bit, but not much because I, I didn't want him ever to think that I was pushing too hard and that I was, you know, using my connection with him to get inside dirt. And I would ask him, like, if he had said something, 
as he was talking, I, I'd say like, uh, do you want that in the book? And then he would think about it and he would often say, no, that doesn't go in the book. That that's, doesn't go in. I'll give you an example. He was there when Yogi Berra was fired by George Steinbrenner as the Yankee manager in 1985, I believe. And that's when the Yankees and Yogi had that big rift. And Yogi got so mad because he had been promised to be the manager all year that he said, I'm never going to come back. And he doesn't come back until 1998. Um the way I wrote that in the book is I was there when Yogi was fired, but that's not my story to tell. And and so I, I William, I, I think the whole idea would be you just have to sort of establish that, make make a connection with the one umpire. Um, and then hopefully that can transition into, well, listen, I, you know, you tell them up front, I'm looking to do this book. I'd love to start with you. And if you have a connection, a colleague, a friend someone else who I could call and this is exactly how it'll look in the, in, in print. I promise you I'm, I'm, I'm upfront and honest and nothing's going to be there that you don't approve of. And um, once he sees that you are legitimate and, and you are who you say you are and you're doing it the way you say you will. Um, I think that would lead to the next person that then, you know, that's sort of the way I'm doing it. And I'm hoping that wasn't the intention at the beginning, but I'm hoping that the good work I did with Roy White leads to another one. And then maybe one after that. And you never know, right? We all have big dreams. Maybe they put me on the mound in Yankee Stadium and I can go in my other book and make an update. And the next Billy Crystal, right? Um, no, thank you so much. That's that's super, super helpful advice. I really appreciate well, it. Thank you. Paul, I have a 1976. Roy yes. White hit one of the most memorable home runs of a game that I went to. Not, Red Sox had like a 10-game lead. The bottom of the ninth, they're winning 4-2. Two outs, somebody gets on base, and Roy White hits a two-run home run to tie it up. They win in 11 innings or 12 innings, Yankees. And that basically was the beginning of the decline of the Red Sox lead, and the Yankees ended up winning it. Was Did that home run, was that as memorable to Paul White? The Roy White as it was to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Um, Roy White, one of the interesting things was, is he, like anybody else who had a career like he did, right? He was a Yankee for 15 years. He batted behind Mickey Mantle. He was the only guy to play on the Yankees for the entire decade of the 70s. Munson would have been as well, but obviously he died in that plane crash in 1979. Um, he, he had a, terrific phenomenal career and he's beloved and but but because he had such a great career there he's very proud of a lot of the things he did so he would always tell the story about i if i hit this home run he says excuse me like in the 1978 playoffs he was the runner-up of uh, world series excuse me he was the runner-up to be the mvp but bucky dent got it so he's very proud to say like i had a great series and i did real well but the moment he says something great he's always self-depreciating right after that and he's like yes but the other guy did this and i you know if gidry hadn't pitched so well um i wouldn't have never had the chance to do that and and things like that but he does talk about the 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 fact that he had that big home run to get the yankees going um and so yes, um, I, I guess the, the quick answer to that question is yes. He he talked about that. So because I think the Yankees won that Friday game and then won the next two games, and that was the beginning of the end for the Red Sox. And it all started with his home run. He also had a home run in the in the playoffs, I believe, against the um, Kansas City Royals. Interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with this book, the Bill James historical as, uh, abstract, right? The updated one. In this book, he talks about the greatest players at each position. He lists Roy White as the 25th greatest left fielder in history. And he compares him favorably to Jim Rice. He said, Roy White's better than Jim Rice. And he goes on to explain it. I'm not going to read you what Bill James wrote. Um, but the interesting thing is, he didn't ever have, 
the the numbers that we all associate with greatness. Yeah. He never hit 30 home runs in a season. He never drove home 100 runs in a year. He never hit 300, but he hit 290 a number of times. He hit over 94 RBIs a couple of times. He never walked 100 times in a season, but he walked 90 something times a couple of times. And you know, sometimes players just have a career like that and you tend to overlook them. Oh, he never hit 300 or he never did this or he never did that. But when you look at the uh, accumulated numbers, they tell a bigger picture. And he talks about a big home run that he hit. I, I think it was in the 78 World Series, actually. I think it was in game three. And it gave the Yankees the lead. That was the game Greg Nettles, by the way, made all those great diving plays. Um, but it gave the Yankees the lead that they never lost. And so it was the game winning home run in essence, the way they used to do game winning RBIs when the statistic first came out, but it came in like the second or third inning. So he had the big hit, but it wasn't the big hit that everybody remembers because it did he didn't do it in the eighth inning. He did it like in the second or third inning. And that sort of defines a lot of how his career went. He did great things, but they sort of got overlooked. I'll, I'll tell you another quick, funny story like that. After he left the Yankees in 1979, Roy White went to play in Japan. He played for the to Tokyo Giants for three seasons. And in the beginning of his career, he batted behind Mickey Mantle. Roy White batted cleanup. And then at the end of his career in 1980, in Japan, he batted cleanup protecting Sadahara O oh in <laughs> Sadahara O's oh last season. And Roy White becomes the first guy ever to win a World Series with the Yamiori Giants and the New York Yankees, the best team um, or the winningest most teams on uh, each league. The only There's only one other guy who ever did that, and that's Hideki Matsui. But as Roy White tells the story, you know, he went over, this is like February, he goes to Japan. He has kids at home. They're in school. So he can't just bring them to Japan. They have to finish the year in school. So the kids don't get to Japan with his wife and kids and his family doesn't arrive to be with him until late June or early July. And he started off great. Typical story, like the way he always would tell a story. I was leading the league in home runs and hitting, you know, 372 or whatever. And then I went into a slump. Uh, when he ever brings himself up, he's always very self-depreciating, but his son comes to his, the first game he ever takes his son to a game in Tokyo to watch him play in Japan. He hits three home runs wow. and he was a switch hitter. So I think he hit two righty and one lefty, or I could have it backwards. And after the game, like everybody's saying his son's the good luck charm. And he's thinking like, you know, tomorrow. I'm going to be like the guy in the newspaper. It's going to be all over. Roy White does this, leads the Giants to victory. And they get the paper the next day, and he's down a little tiny note. Roy White <laughs> hit three home runs because the same game, Sadahara O oh, hit the home run to pass Hank Aaron to be the all-time world home run king. <laughs> and so Sadahara O oh got all the headlines. And, and that's sort of like the story. That's that, That's just the way things sometimes go. Yeah, he was quite a professional, Roy White, very much so. And 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 like I say, the thing that marked him was dignity and class, and um, it just being a great, great human being. And the players all appreciated doing that and playing with him because of that. Because he was, you know, people remember the Yankees at that time, like yeah, like with Reggie and Steinbrenner and Thurman Munson and Sparky Lyle and Billy Martin and fired and he's not fired and all that kind of chaos but then there were players like Roy White and Willie Randolph and Chris Chambliss Gidry um who just went about and did their job and that that part of the story is usually forgotten about everything everybody talks about the chaos but if there weren't other guys on that team who just went out and did their job as professionals the Yankees probably wouldn't have won any of those years because it just would have been chaotic on on all realms they needed some people to help bring the um, temperature down, if you will. I remember a non walk off home run he hit against the Orioles. Uh oh. And Ralph Howe uh, had a more of an extended hissy fit. The, the ball of Frank Ramos had fell into the right field bleachers to catch. He was, would have been a walk off three run homer. 
but Frank Robinson fell into the right field bleachers in Yankee Stadium and caught it. And there were questions about whether the ball came loose at all, but he came up with it in his glove and the umpire rolled him out. Oh, he yeah, he's talked about that out. Like he thought that he won the game. Yeah. I, I, I was I was actually at my little league game with that game on the radio. <laughs> That's awesome. He talks dugout. about that. I, I didn't have the radio on the field. But in the, <laughs> in the oh, Is that the play where uh, Frank Robinson actually punched one of the fans as they were fighting over the ball? Uh, I, I hadn't heard that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know that either. I didn't hear that part of it. I never yeah. heard that. Okay. Yeah. That's a well-known play in an Oriole more. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you another funny one. Uh, it's an Oriole story. You know, Paul Blair was obviously great. They became teammates at the end of Paul Blair's career in the late 70s. Um, it's Paul Blair who replaces Reggie in that game in 77. Um, Roy White hit one to, I guess, dead center field in Memorial Stadium and thought he had a home run. And Paul Blair goes back and leaps over the fence and makes the catch and robs Roy White of the game-winning home run or whatever. And as Paul Blair is running off the field, Roy White sees him. He's like, thanks. Like, really? And he said something like, I'm going to get you back. One day I'm going to get you back. And Roy White was known in left field to leap the wall and, and rob guys of home runs. And he said, I never got him back. <laughs> and then years later, uh, they're at fantasy camp, a Yankee fantasy camp over the winter. And Paul Blair comes in with this big smile on his face. And Roy's like, uh-oh, what's this? And Blair takes out a photograph he must have found of that catch. And he said, remember this, Roy? <laughs> Just like, <laughs> So good stuff like that. Other questions, other things you want me to talk about? Tom, you're a Pirates fan? If you're talking to me, no. No, oh, no I, I think Tom Steich, Tom S. Oh, uh, Tom Steich. Okay. Tom, you got to unmute. I'm sorry, Tom, we can't hear you because because you're on mute. <clears throat> yep. Okay, how's this? Yes. There you go. All right. Now, I grew up in Cleveland, but my dad grew up in western Pennsylvania. So in America, American League, I always rooted for the Indians, and the National League, always for the Pirates. And I remember by Bill Mazeroski's home run mm. at uh, listening to it on WHK radio in Cleveland, where a, a, after he hit the home run, uh, Mazeroski was from Barberton, Ohio, which is near Akron. And the WHK radio station had somebody down there at Mazeroski's mother's house to interview her and ask her how she felt <laughs> about her. A uh, child hitting the game-winning home run in a World Series against the hated New York Yankees, and That's she's great. obviously a Polish, old Polish woman speaking, you know, broken English or what have you, and it still sticks in my mind to this day, which is what sixty-two years ago. I'll never forget it. Now that's awesome. Have you been to PNC Park? Yes, I've seen baseball games and. 47 major league ballparks. Wow. So, yeah. so how would you compare PNC to Camden Yards? It's right up there. The, my top, uh, top four parks are uh, San Francisco Giants, Camden Yards, PNC Park, and Jacobs Field, Progressive Field in Cleveland. Mm. Neat. Yeah, so like I say, we're going in, 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 uh, in May, May 6th. The Pirates are playing the Toronto Blue Jays. 
it was kind of interesting. They're playing a team I've seen a million times in Yankee Stadium. But uh, I'm running the Pittsburgh Marathon with my son the next day. And so we're going to be in Pittsburgh. So we'll go to the game the night before. He's been there. He lives in Hershey, PA. So he's been to two games, I think, at PNC. It's about three hours from his home. But I've never I've never made it all the way out there. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It's, it's, well, if you go visit your son in Hershey from Pittsburgh, you got to stop in Altoona and to see the uh, double-A Altoona Curve baseball team in their park, the baseball park uh, over the right field fence, there's an amusement park with a racing coaster. Now, I don't know if it's still in existence because I haven't seen it there in a couple, couple of years, but that was sort of an interesting experience. Yeah, that sounds great. So, all right, Altoona's uh, on the list then. That sounds great, thank you. And of course the Altoona Tuna Curve is named after a famous Pennsylvania Railroad curve around around this mountain, which you can go see. Uh, it's a 180 degree curve that the train makes uh, to get around the mountain. Then it makes a big left turn to go around the going west, and now that, that's the key area uh, for east-west train traffic. Uh, back in the 40s, the uh, if you go on a tour there, it'll say that that was if the Germany had ever invaded the United States, that was one of the key places they would bomb to stop the rail traffic between east and west from the east coast to the Midwest. Because there's only from uh, New York, Philadelphia, there's only two ways to go Pennsylvania Railroad across uh, Pennsylvania or the New York Central Railroad, which goes up from uh, you know New York. City up to El Albany and across to Buffalo, then down along Lake Erie. Oh, that's fan fantastic history. Thank you, Paul. Yes, sir. If, if you're going to be in Hershey again, um, head down to Reading and uh, catch a Reading Phils game. Uh, great American ballpark down there. Uh, tons of history. Um, I had season tickets there for probably about 17 years and um, uh, got to see some of the great Hall of Famers come through there. Um, Mike Schmidt, uh, Ryan Sandberg, um, uh, but also it's um, uh, Baseball Town USA. Um, it's just a great old minor league park. Um, like Tom said, um, <clears throat> I used to follow all those double A teams and that uh, area and uh, you'll you'll smell the history. Oh, that's awesome! Yes, yep. we'll have to definitely. My, I, like he loves going to ball games, so that sounds great. And, and see if you can find the mistake at Reading. They have plaques of players, major league players that have come through there, and they have Vic Wirtz on there. Yeah, and they they said he made the National League All Star team a certain amount of times. And he, yeah, he didn't. <laughs> yeah, before it was a um, Phillies uh, operation, it was the Cleveland Indians. Um, yeah, so but he made the American League All Star team, not the National. Right, League. right. And Rocky, <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, Rod, uh, Rocky Calavito, Calavito still yeah. lives in Reading because his wife, when he played in Reading in the minors, he uh, met his wife, who was a native from Reading, and when they got married, that's where he stayed in the off season. He still lives there. Wow. Carl Ferrillo lived there for many years. Um, Stony Creek, uh, just outside of Reading. Um, great, great history. Dick Gurner, um, who played in the major leagues. And he was, was a Red Sox, yeah. Yeah. Uh, terrific guy. Um, could talk baseball for hours. Yeah, and I I noticed that Vic Wirtz thing because Vic Wirtz is from my hometown, New York, Pennsylvania. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, and I actually worked with his sister-in-law at a bank here for a little bit. And it was Vic Wirtz who hit the Willie Mays catch, yeah, right? Yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. That ball would have been a home run in every park <laughs> in the world at that time, except Polo Grounds. Yeah. If the World yeah. Series had started in Cleveland and not in New York at the Polo Grounds. The Indians would have won in four straight <laughs> because Wirtz's 460 foot smash would have been a three run home run. And that would have won the game because it would have been an 
because uh, the Giants want to come back from that in the ninth inning. And then the uh, same thing would have happened, but that's life. And that again, the fate, the fate of what happens with, with baseball players. Absolutely. Rocky Colavino was a Yankee for a moment. Uh, yes. yep. Very briefly at the end of his pitched. career. And yeah. he pitched. Did he? You, you, oh, you said he pitched? He pitched yeah, in a 19, game. I think he pitched in two two games as a Yankee, I believe. As a Yankee. I, I knew he pitched in yeah, 1968. Well, mm. the, uh, in the late 50s with the Indians, they, because he had such a great arm, uh, they allowed him to – he came in relief in one game, I remember, it pitched. But uh, <clears throat> so he did have some experience doing that because he had a great right arm. Yeah, he, yeah. he – he was traded. What what was that trade? Harvey Keene? Yeah, yeah. the, the yeah, batting so, champ for the home run champ. champ. Yeah, That's there's right. an interesting story about that. Uh, <clears throat> the worst general manager in the history of the Cleveland Indians <laughs> had to be Frank Trader Lane, who had such a big ego. He made more trades than any other general manager probably in the history of baseball or any other sport. So, because he wanted to see his name in the paper, so. The day before the 1960 season started, he traded the American League home run champion, Calvino and uh, Harmon Killebrew had tied for the home run lead in the American League in 59 with, I think it was 42. He traded to the American League batting champion, who was Harvey Keene, who hit something like 353. And it was the worst trade that killed the Indians' attendance for 35 years mm -hmm. until uh, 94-95. But I'll, my favorite player in 1959 was Terry Francona's father, Tito oh. Francona. Uh, Tito started playing regularly in uh, early May, and he hit 363, played center field. We had a great outfield. That we had Minnie Minoso in left field. Terry... Uh, Tio Francona in center and Rocky Calavito in right. So Tito, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Francona hits 363 with 20 home runs, but he was like five or 10 at bats short of qualifying for the uh, batting title because they later changed the rules so that later on the number of bats he really had counting walks and stuff, he would have made it. Well, for sure, Lane would not have traded Kyler Vito if Tito Francona had been the American League banning leader in 1959. How about that? That's a great thing. I know I'm just looking at the I'm comments. And, and of that. Somebody that mentioned that Babe Ruth, I'm sorry, uh, Babe Ruth played a lot of left field, and he did. Actually, I think Babe Ruth played left field more than right field. But most people oh, consider yeah. the babe a right fielder. So um, I think, whoops, I think that was Jeff who had put that. Yeah, down yeah I did. Yeah. So, yeah, technically, Babe Ruth would be the greatest left fielder, but he would be the greatest any position. So if you put babe <laughs> and right, then the greatest left fielder in Yankee history is uh, is um, Roy White. I think the babe also played very sparingly some first base, especially when yeah. he yeah, came he over from the Red Sox. Yes, he did. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, baby. Ruth... One... Yeah, go on. I got one question about uh, the York Revolution. Um, is Brooks oh. Robinson's statue still there? Yes, it is. Okay. Just curious. <laughs> it's so one there's... of the most unusual ones, too. His statue is has two kids in front of him where he's signing autographs for the kids. Oh, wow. There are statues of kids right in front of him. Fits his reputation as being such a yeah, good guy. Yeah. Wasn't there a picture, uh, Norman Rockwell? Did Norman yes. Rockwell do yeah. one? Yeah. Yes. And, and in fact, in the Norman Rockwell painting, Norman Rockwell painted himself in the painting. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I think he's smoking a cigar or holding a cigar, one of the two, uh, in the painting. Yeah. And, and the Orioles had a giveaway of that poster yeah. uh, last season. Yeah, to commemorate oh. the, what, 50th anniversary uh, of the, the portrait being released. And yeah, he, yeah, exactly. Brooks, Brooks owns the portrait. So he, you know, licensed um, to the Orioles the right to, you know, make little fo uh, photocopies and hand them out to fans. It was great. Oh, that's mm -hmm. great. Does Jeff, you have a picture of it? 
Yeah, I'm trying to get it to show up there. <laughs> I think Norman Rockwell is holding a cigar or smoking it or he's doing something. It, it, there it is. is a little bit. Yeah, you can see it a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And oh, the, that's awesome. The glove that the boy is wearing hanging over the wall, the label is upside down. Oh, really? If you ever notice it, he's leaning over and it should be upside down on the picture, but it's right side up, even though the glove's facing down. Wow. I noticed that's the first time I ever saw this that paint, painting. I can't get it to show right on here. <laughs> Interesting. I think the Babe Ruth statue um, yeah. in is 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 incorrect too, right? Is yeah. it's yeah. a right-handed yeah. glove? The, yes, that's right. It's hooked on his belt. Yeah. But it, it is. is the wrong side, wrong side glove. Yep. On the tour, one one of the people from Baltimore when we were taking the tour with our with my students said, "If you look at the glove, is wrong." Yeah. But yeah. then they say, "You know what? Growing up at St. Mary's Industrial School, oh. maybe they didn't have any lefty gloves." It, yeah, you know there is a picture of him there with a right-handed catcher's mitt because they didn't have left-handed catcher's mitts. His arms are crossed, and it's very, very well known picture. Mm, I know the picture. Yep, yep. Yeah, and he has a catcher's mitt on his left hand. But that was—they say that's only because it was a catcher's mitt because they didn't have right-handed catcher's mitts. Oh, look, William has the picture. Yeah, hang on. Let me unblur my oh. background so the picture can come through. Uh, how do I do that? <laughs> do not blur. Okay. Yeah, he's uh, uh, yeah, standing in the back row. Hands yeah. that that's that's a right right-handed glove, right? Yeah, yeah, he has it on his, on his left hand. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you get that to show up so good. I can't get my thing to show I, up. I, I turned the uh the uh background uh off. Yeah, um, I think you have so, to like if okay. you have a background. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. And I, I I teach um at a, a university that is um oh my goodness, one uh, mile Annie. I'm sorry, William. Annie just made a comment. My dad ran a minor, minor league training camp for the Orioles in 54 to 56, and Brooks played second base there. My yeah. dad and all the coaches recommended he move to third. How cool is that? Yes, he did. You're, are you yeah. talking about George Stoller? <clears throat> he was that, one that of the true. coaches, George Stoller. Mm -hmm. well, well, I think he's the one that switched him to third base. Well, the not really. No. Well, no? not really. I have oh. proof. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. I, I believe dad, you. That's what I heard. No, dad, I, dad actually was in charge of the Browns spring training and then moved over minor league to the Orioles in 54. And um, he actually, I found recently, he actually did like a diary, like what the weather was on this day. And, and then the coaches, they would all talk about the players and how they were doing. Okay. So, um, he, and then again, uh, Brooks Robinson was very young at that time. Probably was his first year in, in well, pro 50, ball. I, I don't know what was it. 55. 55 so yeah. That makes sense. So they yeah. took, there's little blurbs about each player and they liked him very much, but they suggested that he go to third. The group, the group. Of, right. And that, now yeah. I know he played in, in York where I am. I've, yeah. My, my dad managed yeah. York for a while. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. What, what yeah. Was your, what's your dad's name? Bill Enos, E N O S. Yes. Yeah. So he yeah. he managed York. In fact, oh. um, he saw yeah he saw Brooks play, I believe, in York. Or I'm trying to think. Yeah. Was Frank Lucchese in York at one time? Not that he I was, was in Reading. Well, no, I was Reading. too young to go to because a lot of games. At whenever because Dad was there when Frank Lucchese got beaned. I know that. I thought it was York, but, but maybe it was but, Aberdeen. I'm not sure. But one of those. But, but one was of those, George? Was George Aberdeen. Stoller in York? I think George Stoller was in York, wasn't he? I think so, yeah. 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 And that's where I thought they switched him to third from there. But you're saying they it's switched, before, before that? They were talking about him earlier on. Yeah. Oh, okay. They switched him from second based yeah. because to third. Of, yeah, to, to third because of Brooks' his lack of range. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that's, if you that's can believe true. that. It's, but hey, <laughs> it worked out. It yeah, worked it out. Did, yeah, it did, didn't it? It worked out really well. <laughs> the greatest, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I interrupted. I interrupted William. William was telling a story. Oh no, uh, I I teach at uh, UMBC, uh, which is a university that is literally a mile down the road from the old uh, the former St. Mary's Industrial School site, and it just 
I, I can't believe that if I stop to get a McDonald's breakfast on my way into work, I end up like, you know, driving by the first place Babe Ruth ever swung a bat. It's just, it's so surreal to me. That's awesome. Well, the old building is still there and the ball mm-hmm. fields are still there. It's owned by the Archdiocese, if I'm not mistaken. It's, yeah, it's called I think the- that's right. But the, the ball field is is a YMCA field now, uh, which I think oh, it is. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, it's called the Arch Building once um, uh, Cardinal Gibbons closed up because it became a high school. And then, you know, uh, it, it closed up. And the old portion of that building, uh, which once was St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys, is still there and maintained by the Archdiocese. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what it's used for. If it's used for anything, it may just be used for storage now. I'm not sure. Um, but that, yeah, the, the historical part of that building still stands. Amazing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, my, my dad knew Babe Ruth. He worked with him for, yeah, for um, three, three uh, seasons, essentially, at uh, Ray Doan's All-American Baseball School. And uh, Plat- it had moved to Palatka, Florida. And uh, so dad was sort of like an assistant coach at the time in 1941, I would say, 41, uh, before the war. And Babe actually took him bowling. <laughs> So that was pretty amazing that he was able to bowl with the babe. That is phenomenal. How did the babe bowl? Do you know? I don't know. I don't (laughs) know. I'll bet you he he was good. So so (laughs) the babe um, would just go for 10 minutes, you know, and just do a um, kind of a hitting demonstration at the time in Flatka, Florida. So, uh, but he, I guess he rented a room somewhere there and he'd sit on the porch and the boys had to walk two miles and they walk by him and they'd be, you know, trudging by and uh, he'd say, it's good for you. You know, you got to build up those legs. <laughs> so, and he would take a, a cab or whatever, get a ride to the ballpark. <laughs> That's great. But, it's yeah. a great story. Yeah. Uh, that's what's so fun about coming to these meetings is, is just mm. the, the the conversation and and the the things that you learn and the the I I I'm, I'm I I I I watch football. I don't really get into football. Um and that's really it's really just baseball for me. It always has been and I just don't ever see people getting into other sports the way baseball fans get into baseball and have stories of of ballparks and going to games and minor leagues. I mean, they don't have minor leagues, but um, just the way baseball fans romanticize and and love the game and the history of the game and the players. Um, And that just makes it special. This is, this is phenomenal. So um, thank, thank you for having me and and, and for, uh, for for having this conversation, because this is a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, Tom. Uh, Look, if I remember right, across the street from St. Agnes is a cemetery. There's a famous baseball player buried in that cemetery that grew up in Calvert County. His name is was Cupid Childs, and he was the second baseman of the Cleveland Spiders in the 1890s. And he was basically the Roberto Alomar of second baseman in the 1890s. And uh, the uh, Spiders played the Orioles. Were, they played the Orioles one of the years in the Temple Cup and beat them and beat the Orioles. And they lost the other year. But, uh, of course, that was before the turn of the 20th century. So those, those I don't know if there's accurate stats back then. But we, I was trying to do some research many years ago about that we did find his grave in that cemetery that's amazing cool story tom were you happy with the cleveland getting the name the guardians or would you have preferred it to be the spiders because i remember that being a big topic well i uh, i never wanted to name spiders back (laughs) but uh us old indian fans it's going to be difficult to um not use the term Indians. Guardians is okay, but uh, 
for us uh, people over the age of 50, it'll always, it'll always be the Indians. When I, I went to the uh, playoffs last October against Tampa Bay where the Guardians uh, swept the two, and I would say uh, three quarters of the fans still were wearing in the stands Indians gear. Oh, that's amazing. You know, uh, tying it back to Roy White, Roy White grew up in Compton, you know, which is a part of Los Angeles, but his two favorite teams were the Cincinnati Reds and the Cleveland Indians, believe it or not. Loved the Cleveland Indians as a kid growing up. And the reason he liked both of those teams was he loved their uniform colors. He, he wasn't a Yankee fan. He wasn't a Dodger fan. He was a, uh, a Cincinnati Reds and a Cleveland Indian fan, which I, which I find uh, to be so much fun. Both Ted Ohio teams. Yeah, yeah. And uh, for a kid in Los Angeles, sure. which is fun. When will you be coming back to Camden Yards again? Will I be coming back to Camden Yards? Yes. Um, so yeah. right now, uh, yeah, of course, I'm going to go to a game. I'll, I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about Camden Yards in a game. This is one of the, this is again, this is one of those great baseball stories that that just happens the way this is happening, this conversation we're all having. But yes, I can't I can't wait to go back. When am I going to come back this summer? Um, I don't have summer plans yet, so I don't know. Um, I'm working with Roy White on doing book tours and things like that. And I suggested the Babe Ruth Museum. So if we were to go to the museum at the same time that there was a game, um, as I say, I retired in September. So I worked all summer working with my replacement who took over as the principal. And, and I didn't take any vacation days um, or very few over the summer so that I could spend my time with her. So when we went down to the museum last year, as I said, we just did a quick overnight. We drove down, slept the night um, in you know one of those hotel areas outside of Baltimore at the embassy suites, as I recall, yep. drove in did the book talk and then just drove back up the highway back home to New Jersey. We didn't have time to go to the game, which was a shame because it was a saber group. Peter was running a saber group. We're all going to the game that night, but we didn't, we, we had to get back. Cause I think that, I think I talked on a Sunday and um, I was working the next day as I recall, but here's, here's my funny Camden yards uh, baseball story. My sister and her husband used to live in North Carolina and I'm in Northern Jersey. And we decided when they were newly married and my wife and I were newly married, let's meet halfway. So one year we went, met in DC and the next year we met in Baltimore, went to Fort McHenry and all that. And the girls are not big baseball fans, but my brother-in-law um, is a big baseball fan, brother-in-law at the time. Um, and we wanted to go to Camden Yards. This is like 1993 or 94. It was sold out always. So we went up to the ticket window, you know, at 10, 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. or something like that for a night game. And we said, do you have any tickets? And they said, no, we're sold out, sir. We only have standing room only. There was no way our wives were going to go to a baseball game standing room only. So the deal we had made was if we can get tickets to the game, we'll go to the game. But if we don't get tickets to the game, we'll take the water taxi and we'll go to Fells Point and walk around Fells mm -hmm. Point, which we had never been to. And everybody said, you got to go to Fells Point. So we lost. We wouldn't get to go to the game. So we got on a boat on the water taxi and there was a guy about my dad's age wearing a Red Sox hat. Now my dad's a big time lifelong Red Sox fan, the biggest Ted Williams fan in the world. And he was sitting like right across from me on the, on the little boat. So I said, Red Sox fan. He goes, yep. I said, my dad's a big Red Sox fan. Love Teddy ball game. And then we just start talking Red Sox, Johnny Pesky, Bobby door, Mel Parnell back and forth. And he's having a nice time. I'm having a nice time. We're on the boat. And he goes, you going to the game tonight, son? <laughs> I said, ah, we couldn't get tickets. And he goes, oh, I just happened to have four. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> so, so he said, I'll sell them to you for face value. He was running like a bike tour. People had ridden their bikes to get there or something like that. And four people didn't show up. So I went then to my brother-in-law at the time and my wife and my sister. And I said, guess what? We're going to the ball game. Here's, and then we got off at Wells Point, Fells Point, walked around the block, went back on the taxi and came back yep. home and went yep. to the ball game. It was great. Good, they were heartbroken. <laughs> baseball. Story. Baseball yep. saved it. Ted Williams. <laughs> Teddy ball game. So good stuff.
Well, this has been a good one, guys. Oh, this has been fun. Peter, thank you so much. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, you'll have to let me know when you come down. Number one, you know I'm from Scranton. So uh, if you've never been to the Rail Riders, uh, the Yankees AAA, um, I try to go once a year when I go up and visit my mom. Um, I also go to Hershey a lot because it's only 90 minutes here from, from Baltimore. My wife and I like to go to the, the Hershey hockey game maybe once a year if we can get we, we I was just there on Sunday. They had the bear toss, the teddy Bears. bear toss game. The teddy bear toss, yeah. Set a new world record. Um, I contributed. That's great. I have, I have a Hershey Bears hat here somewhere. Um, so All right. Two, two great Baltimore sp let me sports know. things. Oh, yeah. Two great sports things happened in Hershey. Two famous, or two, one less famous, but one major Baltimore sports event took place in Hershey. And one Will was, Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain. Point. 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 Oh, yes. I was at the Chamberlain game. You were there? Yeah. Oh, my God. Wow. That's I didn't awesome. know. I, I was about eight years old, and I didn't really know what was going on. <laughs> Doesn't after. matter. You were there. <laughs> And and I just read uh, Johnny Unitas' autobiography last summer, and I believe his first ever professional game took place in Hershey. That could be. The Colts mm -hmm. played the Eagles up there uh, like two or three or four years in a row way back in the early 60s. Yeah. Like an so, exhibition game. Kind of fun stuff. Okay. Uh, Peter, yeah. I went to college in Wilkes-Barre at uh, King's College. So Yeah, my oh. uncle graduated from there. Yep. Nice. <laughs> All right. So if, as I say, Roy White and I were trying to do a number of uh, you know, book signings and events and things like that. Um, and one of the places we also plan to go is to the Yankee Rail Rider game and 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 do something in, in Wilkesbury Scranton. So when when I know what those dates are, I'll let you know. That'd be great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to all that. When I go up to the Hall of Fame Classic every year in Memorial Day weekend, and if Scranton's home, I stop there on the way home to York for a game. Oh, that's awesome. Would you believe, as a big Yankee fan, I've never been to a Rail Rider game, but I had been there when they were the Red Barons yeah. uh, when I was in college and, yeah. and uh, actually saw them play the Pawtucket Red Sox, which was here's, kind of fun. Here's, here's my story, being from the Scranton area. Mm -hmm. um, they, the Red Barons came into existence in 89, and they built what was then called Lackawanna County Multipurpose Stadium. Yeah. It was a AAA for the Philadelphia for Phillies. And it was basically built, it, was eight, it opened in 89. It was built at the Mini Veteran Stadium. So it had the exact same dimensions, shape, and astroturf of the vet, um, which was, you know, cutting edge at one point, but by once Camden Yard opened, all that stuff was going out the window. Um, so when the Yankees took over in, I want to say 06 or 07, the first thing they did was replace the, um, the turf with the uh, natural grass. Um, and of course they were like, this place is so outdated. It needs to go, but, 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 so, um, in the offs, uh, because Scranton gets so much snow and cold, they couldn't do renovations and, and, you know, basically demolition construction on the same site during the off season. So in 2012, the Scranton Yankees at that point played all of their home games, either in Rochester or Allentown. So they basically were on the road the entire season. Um, and then the PNC field, I think's first year as it is now, is the um, was open in 2013. And then they changed their name to coincide with the, uh, the reintroduction uh, of, of the new uh, ballpark. So it's gorgeous. It's, it's, it, it's, it's really nice. It was horrible as the Red Barons field. Um, my high school football uh, high school that I went to in Scranton, our high school football team played there. Um, in the fall and winter because it was multi-purpose was easily converted. Um, so it was a really bad venue, um, but it's, it's really nice now. And uh, I think the Phillies ran their course up there. And I think as a uh, Yankees AAA team, they've been much more um, successful in terms of, of drawing uh, fans. And because of the proximity to New York city, it's, it's a quick call up for uh, to get to Yankee stadium. Pete, I just finished John Feinstein's uh, book, Where Nobody Knows Your Name. Yep. And he mentions, there, yep. he mentions that Yankee team with no home frequently. No home for the 2012 season, yep. Yep, yeah, and that they did so well, you know, and, and played on the road the whole season. 
No. I grew up there. So the first, the first year of AAA baseball there was 1989. And uh, it was a summer I turned 15. So I remember when it was brand new and it was baseball in Northeast PA because we don't have anything up here. Um, it, was a, it was a big deal, but the novelty wore off after a couple of years. Um, and, you know, the Phillies were pretty terrible for most of the 90s. <laughs> yeah, I, I was not a Phillies fan. So when, you know, when, when the Phillies were bad, I, I was happy. You know, I was I was fine with that. And then, of course, I married a Philly girl. So I have to watch <laughs> <them> out. So. <laughs> um, well, thank you, guys. Uh, hopefully, those of you who live locally will, will come to our uh, Sabre Day on uh, in 19 days. Um, got a pretty good lineup. And uh, hopefully we're going to have, you know, 30, 40 people or so. Um, we're not Zooming it, unfortunately, but some of it will be recorded and be up on YouTube, um, you know, down the line. So, Paul, I'm looking forward to your next book when it comes out. I'll pick it up down the line. Um, thank you. Probably by Sabre 50, uh, 51. I have to correct myself, 51. Um, if anybody's going to Chicago this summer, hopefully I'll, I'll see you guys there for you out-of-towners. Um, and uh, the Orioles home opener this year is on Holy Thursday against the Yankees, so I'll be there. So Awesome. Listen, I, Paul, uh, Pete, I, I want to thank everybody um, from Tampa. Well, I'm from New York via Tampa, but um, uh, I, I love your meeting. Um, and we're looking for speakers. If anybody wants to speak, Paul is scheduled for us, I think June. May I or think June? so. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm lo really looking forward to that. And by the way, um, if you talk to Roy and you guys want to um, uh, defrost and come down, you know, spring trainings down here and, uh, you know, maybe we can set you guys up with some kind of a signing. That would be uh, awesome. But, he was just there for fantasy camp. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll come, talk to him about it. Come take the warmth. I would love to. 79 today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pitchers and catches report in what? 10, 12 days. So. Yep. Yeah. Um, Exciting. So hopefully everybody's doing well. For those of us here in the Mid Atlantic, we have to stay warm for a little while. Um, Thanks for allowing me to sit in. <laughs> Absolutely. We're here all the time. So you guys, uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, follow us on Facebook. I send messages probably once or twice every other week. Um, so this was greatly appreciated. I'll have Jacob put it up on YouTube in the next day or so. And uh, Paul will be in touch. Um, and if you have any questions about ballparks, I think 20 or 22 out of the current 30. So I can throw my, my opinion in on a few here too. So That's awesome. Thank, thank you everybody for having me. This was just so much fun. Um, there couldn't be nicer people. I'm so glad that I've gotten involved with Sabre and, and, and having the chance to come to these meetings. Every one of them is great. I love the discussion today. Annie, I uh, love hearing about your, your dad and moving Brooks Robinson. Yeah, was this was great. So, so many great stories. And, uh, be, uh, be, sure to, be sure to buy Lee Lowenfish's uh, book that's coming out uh, April 1st, because I spent over a year with him talking about dad's scouting career. So um, April 1st, uh, University of Nebraska Press mm. coming out. And um, I think it'll be an interesting book. Dad, dad has a chapter. So <laughs> that's great. Uh, all right, guys, we'll have yeah. a great night and we'll see, see you all. Uh, yeah. See you all again. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah. Great, great. great day, everybody. Happy February. Happy Thank Groundhog you. Day. <laughs> Tomorrow, yes. Thank you.